everybody. My name is Darren Calhoun, pronouns he, him, and I have the pleasure of serving with the board of directors for, or for I'm about to say my church. Uh, I have the pleasure of serving with the board of directors for Q Christian Fellowship and have been, along with Carrie and a few other folks, uh, have been one of the facilitators who's been curating and bringing together this gathering of people and experiences, um, all at the intersection of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, along with belonging. And the idea here is, uh, even though even though the topic is something you may have heard of at work or something that you may have seen in the in the headlines recently, we at Q Christian Fellowship believe that this is important and critical to how we exist, both at the individual level. So a gathering like this where people from our community have opportunities to learn and to grow, but also at the institutional level. And what that means is we do things like audit how our spending happens. We audit um, where we have conferences, who's speaking, um, what are the, the policies and how do those affect people of color uh, versus people who are raised as white. All of those things go into um, having a more equitable kind of uh, community that is Q Christian Fellowship. And so um, one of so on that individual side, we have these monthly gatherings. Uh, currently, they are on the first Sunday of the month, and we feature or bring in people uh, of different experiences so that we can hear from them, learn about what they're doing in the world and what their experience is. And so tonight will be a fishbowl conversation where uh, most of us who are gathered here will just kind of have a, a, a front row seat to a conversation between um, two individuals of two-spirit experience and the rest of us get to watch, learn, listen. Um, we encourage you to write down questions. We encourage you to um, to write down notes for later discussion. You can always email us. Um, just visit the QCF website and you'll see that or we'll edit in a, a little email address at the end. But uh, we want you to, to have these opportunities to learn, to grow. And then in our other gatherings, we make space to talk about what we've been learning uh, together. So with that being said, uh, I'm really excited about our topic tonight. We are diving into uh, two-spirit experiences and what that means. And so uh, I have two wonderful folks who are going to be speaking. Um, one is the Reverend Shaniqua, who I'm just meeting, but already have seen so many great articles and so much great work that that uh, she is doing. And then uh, one of my good buddies is joining uh, the Reverend Jerry Maynard, uh, who we 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 have been troubling the waters for a few years when it comes to to, to justice work uh, within faith and queer spaces. And so I'm so glad that both of them could be here with us tonight. And I will let them tell you a bit more about themselves. Um, I'm going to bring them on screen now. All right, we're all here, and uh, yeah, let's uh, let's go go ahead and introduce yourselves, and uh, maybe we can start with Reverend Jerry. Well, hello, hello, good evening, good afternoon, whatever time of day it is, wherever you are. Um, I hope you are all well. I um, am coming to you from Humboldt, Texas, which is northeast of Houston, Texas, the city I live in. This is the traditional lands the Atatapa Ishak people and also the Karankoa um, and the uh, Cariso Kame Krugo. And uh, it's good to be with you today. Fullness and go for it, Reverend Shaniqua. Hello, I'm Shaniqua Brokenleg and um, I'm coming to you from Sioux Falls, South Dakota, which is the home of the Ocheti Shakoni or the Seven Council Fires of the Lakota, Dakota, Nakoto people. And those are my people. So I'm on my own land. And um, I don't know if I'm Sichango Lakota, which means I'm an enrolled member of the Rosebud Sioux tribe. Fullness. And thank you. Thank you both for being here tonight. We, uh, we usually make this space as a as mostly a conversation um, where you are free to to talk just the way you would um, with your own kiki session on your own, um, but just to help us to help us uh, kind of set the the atmosphere here, um, there is a uh, video and Jerry, if you could uh, set that up for us, give us some context, and I'll get ready for, to play it. 
Sure. Um, we recently, within the last uh, 24 hours, 48 hours or so, have received the news that a, a popular Native actor, Cole Brings Plenty, was found uh, mysteriously unalive uh, recently after going missing. And I thought that it was a great, um, this would be a great moment for us to root ourselves in understanding that Native peoples undergo a lot of violence. Uh, and sometimes that violence is manifested because of generational trauma. And all of that disconnects us from our true self, which is that we are each sacred beings meant to have a sacred experience in this realm. And so I thought this short video would be a good visual meditation for us to reflect upon. It is by, uh, it's called uh, Lifeline by the native hip hop artist, Superman. And uh, he showcases a eagle feather as a part of his teaching for this video. So I hope you enjoy it and it brings some healing medicine to you. The beauty of life is all around us. It's our lifeline, our connection. When we enter this life, we're free. But then we start to learn. We start to be taught and told who we are and what we are. We become disconnected. We use alcohol and drugs. We allow jealousy and envy to come into our lives. We believe and spread gossip, attaching ourselves to false assumptions and judging others every day. Hanging with the wrong people and distancing ourselves from the truth. We're left unbalanced and disconnected. We realize we need to slow down and reflect. We need to pray again. We need to start to unlearn and practice gratitude and surround ourselves with positive friends and mentors. And when we forgive ourselves and love ourselves just the way we are, we're able to forgive others and love them just the way they are. We become connected again, connected to our lifeline, connected to all that exists, and we become free again. And that is beautiful. Um, thank you so much for sharing that with us, uh, Reverend Jerry. Anything else to add about the about that reflection? Uh, no, I, I think what I really find very nice about it is I enjoy the visual of the eagle feather, which is a ceremonial thing that we use for a ceremony and prayer, and how he shows all these different things break break our sense of our sacredness. But when we practice patience and love and prayer and ritual, it, it reconnects us and, and all that. So I think that's beautiful. Good reminder. Amen. Amen. Um, and so for us to, to get started, um, maybe you could just talk a little bit about um, about your own uh, your own understanding of what two spirit is and uh, where this term comes from. And just feel free to just pop in. Okay. <laughs> On my screen, Jerry, you're pointing somewhere else, like <laughs> off to the, <laughs> um, the Brady Bunch so, up and down, right? <laughs> yeah. Two Spirit is a, it's an invented word. It's a created word. Um, before Indians were put in urban areas, so that was in like the 50s and 60s, each tribe had their own word for this thing. And as Indians from multiple tribes got put into urban areas, then they understood that they had these roles, but they each had their own language for those roles. Like in Lakota, the word for mine would be winkte, for me as a male body two-spirit. And if you're a female body two-spirit, our word is blokawi. And, um, but that would be different for an Ojibwe or a Navajo or whatever. And so they wanted to create a word that we could use in English. And so they came up with the word two-spirit, meaning that you have the spirit of the masculine and the feminine. And in... Lakota way of thinking, we would say that you walk between those worlds, but you also walk between the worlds of the natural and the supernatural. And so you exist in that liminal space. 
but when that word came about, it's probably in the 80s, I'm guessing somewhere in that neighborhood, um, there is probably official fancy somebody. But it, when that term was coined, we understood that that word makes sense in English, but it's not meant to be translated back into the native language because when you do that, like in Lakota, we have multiple words for spirit, depending on like one we use for Holy Spirit, one spirit is like a ghost or a soul. And so it can sound like you're possessed if you translate it back into the native language sometimes. So it doesn't always work well to use that. So most people will use their own traditional word for that. Or when you're talking to folks from other places, you would use two spirits so people can talk and know what everybody else is talking about. Gotcha. That's, that's super helpful. Um, and, uh, to, to give us some background and context, like, uh, what, what is your, what is your story of coming to understand yourself as two spirit? Do you want to go first, Jerry? Um, I, that's a good question. Um, I, I would add to what Shaniko said that it came, it was actually invented in 1990 in Canada. Um, at a uh, pan-native conference. I don't remember the exact date. My ADHD isn't working. <laughs> <laughs> It'll kick in later, don't worry about it. Um, I think every, well, every tribe has traditionally like different ways of identifying uh, who a two-spirit person might be. Um, um, but I think for, for myself, we had roles, like special roles that each one of us would do. And as I was growing up, um, because my family is a bit uh, disconnected from our tribe, uh, there was certain ancestral memory that we had that I think creeped up into how we, we did things that we didn't always necessarily understand. And one of those was um, I oftentimes got called upon, even as a child, to be the one who leads prayer at different events, um, who sings for the family, who speaks on behalf of the family. And um, it wasn't until uh, I began talking more, more with elders and other parts of the family um, that I learned more about that I was called upon that because that was part of our traditional understanding of two spirit people engaging with the family as that go between between um, the community and the extended human family um, as that bridge point. Uh, just like Shanika was saying, you know, we are the bridge between the masculine, the feminine, and the sacred and the profane, but we're also the bridge between our local community and the extended human community as well. Cool. Um, anything, anything to share, Shanika? Uh, growing up, uh, my grandparents told me stories about Wink Day and like the roles in society, um, what they do, how they behave. Um, and it wasn't until I was a little older that I realized they were only telling me those stories and not all my cousins those stories. And so, um, I think they knew before I did. Um, and, uh, they introduced me to other Wink Day people without telling me that those people were Wink Day. Um, one was like a museum curator, one was a medical provider, one was uh, like a medicine person uh, or shaman or whatever word you want to use for that, a uh, spiritual leader. And, um, and then uh, later, we don't really think about it in terms of coming out, we think about it in terms of coming in. So like coming into your community in that role to fulfill the spiritual and social role that you have. So when that happened, then um, then they told me, like, you know, so-and-so and so-and-so and such-and-such, -and, -so and, such, and you can talk to those people if, if you have questions that we can't answer. Um, and uh, what else? I think other things that we do, a long time ago, there's, like, a ceremony that we do that would, would um, sort of determine if you were Wink Day, but um, that, uh, like, you know, it's not like a trick. Like, you know full well going into that if you bring out certain objects that, that that would mean that you are weekday versus not. And I think growing up, uh, I would do things that were like the female way of doing something. They they pointed it out to me, but not in a judgmental way. It was like, you know, you're dancing like the women. I was like, yeah, I know I'm dancing like the women. And that was the end of it. Like there was no like correction to dance like a man. It was just, this is okay. And and uh, for us, it's an honor to have one of them in your 
in your family. So uh, for a community to be considered healthy, you have to have men and women who heal with medicine, men and women who heal with ceremony. Um, you have to have political social leaders uh, and uh, you have to have strategic or military leaders and you have to have uh, two-spirit people. Awesome. And then if uh, if you could share a little bit more, one, it it absolutely sounds wonderful to have grown up uh, with people already understanding or at least having a hint about who you are and what that means. Um, I love that you mentioned that. If you could talk a little bit more about that and talk a little bit about um, about that spiritual and natural connection or this this special role within the community. Um, I don't know. I don't think I caught the first part, like what, what the first no part problem. was that, that I, you I, I have great big questions. Um, one, what was it like to just grow up having, um, having a family or even a community that already maybe it sounds like already understood you and were welcoming you before you even could welcome yourself. Uh, if you could talk a little bit more about how that felt for you, um, and then talk about the spiritual, uh, component of this as well. Ooh, okay, I that's a hard one to answer just because I don't I don't have the opposite experience to compare it to. Like I okay. don't know what it's like to grow up in the other way. Like for me, I think what I like about it is I can always bring my whole self. When I'm working in Indian country, I can always bring my whole self. And so, um, like there wasn't a sense of this is bad or wrong or anything like that. Um, and my grandpa, who was also an Episcopal priest, uh, was was very supportive and I think once in school someone said faggot and um the teacher like stopped the class and did a whole like 10 minute lecture about wink day and two spirit and like how we're supposed to be treated and stuff and that was at the school on the reservation and then when I got to high school and I never heard that word again uh, and then when I got to high school the only people who ever caused problem were like the white folks that were at the high school and they sometimes would say things but they would be corrected by them the native people that were nearby um so when i work in indian country i can be both a person of color and indigenous and two-spirit and lgbt whereas i think in the lgbt community often you can only be lgbt they don't want to hear about their racism or their misogyny or whatever so i'm much more comfortable working in, in indian country and i don't know what else to say other than um, that i guess <laughs> Well, I definitely did not have that experience. <laughs> I I very, very clearly remember being called a fag, uh, a sissy, a fairy, all of those things, which I love referring to myself as very proudly. Um, I I did have a, a pretty, I think, a pretty decent supportive system in my internal family, um, particularly from my mother. Um, when I was growing up, I... I wore the women's clothes and I used to carry a purse with me everywhere I went. Um, and uh, I loved it. I was obsessed. Um, and uh, my mom was very supportive of that. Um, I think she didn't really fully understand it, but she was very supportive of it. Um, and I definitely did experience a lot of homophobia in uh, school. And and what was the second question? The second, the second was a, a kind of a bridge, maybe into um, both of you have named this the spiritual um, significance mm -hmm. of being two spirit, and both of you are serving as clergy. Are, are all two spirit folks clergy, or um, and you know I, that's a that's a rhetorical question, but give us a little bit more idea about um, about that spiritual connection to to this uh, identity. Mm -hmm. I think it's a lot of like we're called to be in the liminal space, the space between, so between and within the masculine and feminine space, and the space between the natural and supernatural. In Makoto, we wouldn't think of something as profane. We would think of it only as like all things are good. We don't have a word for evil or the devil. We had to create one when Christianity came. Um, so we would think of it just in the in between the what exists in the natural world, like the or sorry, the natural world and then what exists in the spirit world. And so we're called to walk within those spaces. If there's things that um, people 
normally wouldn't do, we can do that. Or if there's like things that only men do or only women do, we can do them both. And so sometimes if there's not enough of one, we would cover to balance and do the other, do the other. Um, and a lot of, we're called to be reconcilers in that liminal space. So, so to reconcile difference if there's it, whether it be like someone who's struggling spiritually or emotionally or physically in that healing space, we will reconcile, help folks reconcile with that. And I, most of us, I think, have like definitely spiritual roles. So we might not all be clergy, but we might be in the broadest sense clergy in the sense that we have ceremonial roles that, that we do. Um, I think not everybody does it because not everybody grew up in the culture maybe. And so they don't always know what that, you know, what that might be. But if they have like a mentor or somebody else, then they will learn, you know, we will give them responsibilities. As, I mean, everybody gets that if they grew up. In the, like in the Lakota way, we, we always teach the young ones and we know that they're going to make mistakes. That's just how it happens. And that's fine. Everything should have at least one mistake, including liturgy. And so you um, teach them and, and your goal is to work yourself out of a job so somebody else can, can do it instead of you. I love that. <laughs> Jerry, what would you add? Um, I think we have... Uh... So at least for for us, um, I think it's really quite funny um, that one of the ways uh, that we try to survive after colonization or during colonization is that um, some of our medicine people and other ceremony leaders did actually end up becoming clergy because that was an easy way to kind of subtly keep our traditions alive. Um, for us in my tribe, we, uh, we were oftentimes um, in charge of very specific ceremonies, um, usually around uh, life transitions. Um, if you look at old codexes of um, the way we dressed in different ceremonies we had, we were often depicted with flowers wrapped around our leg to uh, indicate that we were safeguarders of the um, sacred medicines that were used for hallucinogenic purposes. Um, I have a little bit of a hand in this uh, kind of emergent field uh, of like at the intersection of psychology and, and spirituality where people are starting to explore those kinds of things um, like, like uh, hallucinogenics and how that reflects to, uh, refers to spirituality. Um, so that's a little bit of a way that I keep some of my traditional uh, teachings alive. And um, I think also too, for us, it manifests in the sense of being available for journeying with people through different types of spiritual experiences that they are having or going through. And because Native people don't really make a distinction between um, the sacred and the material, because both the material is good and sacred, and what is sacred is also material. Um, it's sometimes part of that job is showing people that each part of their lived experience is inherently sacred, even if it's a bad one. Uh, you can always learn from it. You can always grow from it. Uh, and journeying with them through that, helping to weave through those experiences um, is one of the ways, at least, that I show up. Yeah, and I I, I really appreciate it. I know I'm thinking about queerness in general um, and how after the Pulse Orlando nightclub shooting, um, many people described that as a violation of sanctuary. Um, mm -hmm. And they talked about how for many people, a, a, a gay club or an LGBTQ plus club is one of the few places that they're able to be their whole selves to be out. And then for that to get uh, for you know, an act of violence to happen in that way that felt like a spiritual attack and and not just a, you know, not just violence, but it was there was something there was something transcendent or otherworldly about um the safety and in, and inclusion people experienced there. Um, so I'd say all that to 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 want to appreciate uh, that there are this inherently spiritual special role if you will within community right that uh that you get to grow up with that or or at least there's a a known place for it um, in your communities um i'm wondering what that looks like for 
uh, and we've already hinted on a little bit, Christianity being kind of a colonizer thing. Um, what what has uh, what has reclaiming uh, Christian spirituality? What has what are things that maybe you're you're holding on to, or what things that you distance yourself from? If that if that makes sense, like as we talk about mm -hmm. this relationship between Christianity, violence, and uh, an indigenous identity. Dig in if you just want to dig into that. That'd be awesome. <laughs> That's a hard question for me to answer. I'm just a misfit in every way, <laughs> including in well, my, talk about it, including in my Christianity. You know, um, uh, I was ordained in a breakaway movement in the Catholic Church, um, and then, uh, but I also currently work for a Lutheran church, and um, so. I'm surrounded by a bunch of different expressions of Christianity. And there are days after church where I'm like, you know what? I'm tired of Christians. <laughs> I, I like, I'm gonna go to a powwow. I'm gonna go hang out with elders and and just not worry about this nonsense anymore. Uh and um, but even still, it's um for me, I have found an interesting way to. Um, push the imagination of what does it mean to be a disciple? Um, what does it mean to be an ordained person? And um, and kind of paint outside of those lines as a as another way to, again, weave us back into uh, a sense of connection and balance. Um, and that could look in a variety of ways on a daily basis. Um, like, for instance, a couple of weeks ago, we were at church and it was, uh, we were getting... We were in the middle of a liturgy and um, I had gotten up to go get some tea and me being meek with all my ADHD neurodivergence, I was like making my tea. I was having this whole lovely experience with myself, me, myself and I. Um, and then all of a sudden I realized it was so quiet. And I thought, what's going on? So I looked out the, the, <laughs> the doorway into the sanctuary and Somebody in the congregation was like, oh, we're just waiting for you. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> Here I come. And I was, because it was time for me to play the song uh, or something or whatever. And uh, um, so that, two spirit people can be like that um, because we were meant to help bring balance to situations. So sometimes if things are too serious, we can be very playful. And if things are too playful, we can be more serious. Um, and uh, so that's, Kind of how I do it. I also am very blunt with people and be like, I don't think any of that makes any sense. Um, I think it's a waste of time. Why don't we do this instead? <laughs> um, yeah, so that's enough about me. Go for it. I see you nod your head, Shaniko. I, I think like that sort of struggle that I have sometimes thinking about the colonizer myth of Christianity um, and uh, when they found the children that were buried in the boarding schools in Canada. I remember really struggling and I went uh, to the Black Hills, which is our one of our sacred areas and sat and prayed. And what came to me was the story of the prodigal son. And I was thinking about how um, that's like the church, the church is in that story, right? And so you have like the original church, it's all about love and goodness and all of that. And that was, with people of color, right? And then you have the part of the church that got tied up in empire and power and greed and like took all of our shared family resources and our children and our, our um, minerals and our land and our culture and all of that stuff and spent it in dissolute living, right? You still have this authentic piece of the church that is there. And I think we're at the story in the, in the, the part of the story where I think our Western righteousness, which is like all the white Jesus and the white supremacy that exists in our hymnody and all that business. I need that on the They're trying to realize that <laughs> is like, that's not sustainable. They, they know that now and they realize, at least are beginning to realize some of them the error of that. And so they're feeding the pigs and they're like, what are we going to do? And I think about coming back. And I think what I was sort of called to, to question in myself, which I still haven't answered is if and when that happens, am I going to be like the dad and welcome them? Or am I going to be like the brother and not come into the house because I'm still angry <laughs> and I think that's sort of where I sit with that and it's, it's a, 
I'm working through it. Um, and I think part of the other piece of that is um, in Indian country, we have like the, in that righteousness model, there's the old theology that was sort of like, the things that make us indigenous are bad. And in order to be Christian, you must be white. And that's a, totally not listening to Paul, right? The question was, must you become a Jew before you can become a Christian? Paul says, no, you don't have to. But somehow, somewhere, people think you have to be white first or cisgender or straight or whatever else they want to put on you. Uh, before you can become Christian. And so that old theology, still some of our elders have some of that where they're like, oh, we can't come in church or, oh, we shouldn't, blah, blah, you know, all of that mess. And then you have the new new theology, or at least it's not really new, it's actually old, that's new again. But like the idea that we can be fully integrated and our own history and ceremonies and, and all of that stuff is our own Old Testament and it's not bad or 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 it's, it's, it's holy in and of itself. And we can bring that into our worship and into our lives and into what we do. That's what's up. Are you about to say something, Jerry? No, no. I was just doing the the, the gay church. Amen. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so um, to, to, to go back on the, on the, the educating and, and understanding side, um, Many people uh, wonder, is Two-Spirit just the equivalent of trans within the LGBTQ rainbow, or would you say that it's different? Um, and if so, how? I would say it's different and also yes. <laughs> uh, it, so it's, it is a placeholder term, and so it kind of can be a little bit flexible. Um, but um, I would say that in a lot of tribes, um, being trans uh, is its own identity in and of itself. Um, and being two-spirit really is about this idea of being this in-between reality. Um, and uh, though I do know some two-spirit people who use the terms two-spirit and trans interchangeably, uh, and I think that's partly because we're still trying to grapple with some of the language around gender, which I, I taught a class last year um, online on uh, gender, sexuality, and theology. And one of the really big parts of that class was trying to emphasize to people that a lot of these words are very new. Um, and we're still trying to learn what they really fully mean. Um, and so I think I think we can have some grace with it and have some um, appreciation of the gray space. But I also think that there are clear, distinct differences um, between two-spirit and trans identity. Yeah, I think from a Lakota perspective, we have like three or four genders. Um, so we would have male, female, and then two spirit. And I don't know if we just, so it'd be three if you delineate between a male body, two spirit and a female body, two spirit, which I don't know that we would necessarily, but we have different words for them. So maybe we would, but like, if you were a transgendered woman, you would just be a woman. If you're a transgender man, you would just be a man. Um, mm-hmm. Just is probably not the right word to use, but like, we wouldn't differentiate between those things. Um, but if you're two spirit, that's a different, it's like a third gender. It's its own separate thing. And I think one of the, I guess it's, it's a blessing and a curse sometimes. In Western culture, we have this idea of there has to be a category in a box for everything. And I think as Indian people, we don't really think in that way. It's more like this really complicated, messy Venn diagram of everything. <laughs> There's spots where things go overlap and, you know, and so I think, um, I don't, I definitely think like the closest thing in people ask is I kind of say maybe it's like non-binary, but not really. It's more like the opposite of non-binary where you're both rather than non-binary be like you're, you're neither. Right. But this is more like it's, it's, I don't know. It's, it's, Are we going to struggle with a new term, pan-binary? <laughs> maybe. Yeah. Something. It's something. And I also think like sometimes people ask, like they think that, I wouldn't identify myself as transgender, but I definitely feel like I fit under the umbrella that has a lot of those different things in there mm-hmm. if we were to. And so I never know, like, if somebody's like, oh, this is a trans thing, you should come. I never know, if, like, should I come or should I not? Come? Like, where, where, you know, and I'm like, if they ask me to come, I will come. And, you know, but I won't necessarily put myself in that space. I would also, too, point out that, like, 
Native people have traditionally always had a very full integrated understanding of the human condition. Um, and some of our uh, contemporary gender terms, I think can be uh, a bit reductionary because it, re it brings people down mm -hmm. into the types of genitalia they might have or who they go to bed with or who they don't go to bed with um, or how many people they go to bed with. Um, and uh, um, I think that we have to, part of the identity and the role of two-spirit people is a reminding of the body of Christ, of the human family, that uh, we are big, robust, beautiful entities. Um, and so we don't want to overly focus on one particular part of our identity, though we want to have a much more fuller understanding of our, um, of our beingness. And uh, when it comes to identifying or describing yourself, uh, is it would it be appropriate for anyone who's not native or not uh, indigenous to to use specifically two spirit if they say they feel like they resonate with that? Could you unpack that for us? I would say no. Same. Like I think if you are indigenous, then yes, you can be two spirit. But I think. Like the, one of the defining characteristics is that you must be indigenous to be two spirit. So you can identify with a lot of the ideas of, you know, walking in between or between both things and walking between masculine and feminine and natural and supernatural and all of those pieces. But to be indigenous, you must be like, in order to be two spirit, you must be indigenous. Yeah. The one exception would be, I think, because we have like adoption in our culture. So I think if there was a, uh, like if somebody was like, for example, a non-native person adopted by a native family, grew up in the culture, speaks the language, all of that, and I, don't, I think then it would be different. I think then, yes, they could use that term, but that's because they're like, they would be considered part of the culture and they would be considered indigenous, maybe not legally, but mm -hmm. culturally. I, I want to add to that also in that I really want people to grasp on this idea um, that, um, being two-spirit is not a self-identifier. Um, it is something that comes out of community. Um, Shaniqua's community pulled that out of her. They saw it, they saw this part of her, her who she is, and they invited her into under that understanding. The same with my family and other tribes. So it is a, um, it's a community reality um, that is helped ushered in um, and not necessarily a self-identification, which can be a distinction between uh, indigenous understandings and non-indigenous understandings, that for a lot of us in the LGBT community, our narrative is heavily focused on um, self-identifying, self-discovery, and coming out, and being in opposition to uh, to the um, I don't know. I don't know what you want to call it. The straight world, <laughs> the, <laughs> the normative world. <laughs> um, and uh, and that's not how we do things. You know, this is about a community because we don't just show up in the world as ourselves. We show up as our community, our ancestors, those who have gone before us and those who are coming after us. Um, so I think that's an important distinction to keep in mind. Yeah. And is there, um, and uh, a few folks asked as well, is is there an, uh, an intersection or how might this relate to someone being intersexed or somebody who's born with, uh, you know, a medical medical condition that means their 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 biological sex is ambiguous, just for you know for background and context. Is is there an intersection there, or what might that look like within the within native cultures? I would say yes. Go ahead. My I would say yes from my perspective, just in because I do know a couple of Native people who are intersex um, and who self-identify with the term two-spirit um, as well as intersex, um, but they're not here, so I'm not going to speak for them. But I, I would say that's my own understanding of it. Um, I had another thought, but now I went out the window. Anyway, continue. Go ahead, Sunita. I think that, like, it would depend on how they felt. 
So like, because we don't delineate between a trans male and a trans female and a cisgender male, and a cis I mean, we delineate between male and female, but like a trans versus a cisgender female and a trans and a cisgender male, we wouldn't delineate. So if that person grew up and identified one way or the other, that's just what they would be. But I think because we see difference as sacred, which is I think a big difference from like Western culture, native people see difference as sacred versus as other or bad. And so if somebody was born intersex, they would already be like, we're like, ooh, they're very holy. And so that means we need to like, be very like careful and watch them and um, like make sure they're uh, treated, not that we treat other people badly, but you know, like treat them well and make sure that we, we treat them as the gifts that they are. And that also means that they probably have a lot to teach us. Um, and so we would want to pay attention to that. And as they grew up, as they were growing up, did in that walk between space, they probably would be considered two-spirit. Um, and uh, just a little bit a, a little bit more on that, we believe that everybody, when you're born, so let's just use the metaphor of a glass of water, the creator gives everybody a full glass of water that's made up of spiritual, emotional, social, and, and physical gifts, um, mental gifts too, so I forgot about that one. And if for some reason someone is missing something, not that intersex people are missing anything, but I'm thinking more on other abilities. Um, they still have a full glass of water. And if we don't realize how that glass is full, that's our own uh, problem, not on the person. So if someone like, for example, couldn't hear, that's not about us thinking they are deficient somehow. It's us not recognizing the other gifts that they have and our failure to, to be able to see those gifts. That that is so important. Um, it makes me think about again this the bigger conversation of disability and Western thoughts that that again have this there's something missing idea versus um, non-Western ideas that look at things very very differently. Um, what what would you say? Um, what what would you say is something that people typically get wrong about being two spirit? Or misunderstand, you know, misunderstand or get wrong, or or maybe are insensitive about. People think I'm transgendered a lot. I think they just assume that I'm somehow in this transitional journey and and haven't completed some something or something. And I feel like no, this is just who I am. And I think like I think a lot of it is because I use the she/her pronouns. And in Lakota culture, our language doesn't have pronouns. We, we, the boys speak differently than the girls. And if you were to listen to me speak, it would be, I would speak like a woman. And that's how you would, and actually that's what the word means. We, wink day is short for we ink day, which means talk like a woman. Um, and so, but because I use this year pronouns, I think that, that does people think that, but I use those pronouns to bring the balance because I think I present fairly masculine and people see me. And I think that helps. Uh, that's also why I like Shaniqua because it, it like helps shift the, the gender idea. I love that. Um, Jerry, you look like you're about to, to chime in. Um, I think I have a similar experience. I do get people who ask me if I'm trans, and my answer is always no, I, but I exist under that umbrella. Um, and then I also dance in other, under under umbrellas because I can't just have one. I have to have a bunch. <laughs> All the umbrellas. <laughs> um, yes, designer to match my shoes. Um, <laughs> and, uh, um, I think for me, uh, it, it's not really necessarily a mistake on the other person's part. I think it's just more a reflection of myself. Um, I oftentimes feel uncomfortable or maybe some slight awkwardness uh, in certain spaces because I think people forget that I'm two spirit and then I have to be that I don't have to, but that I behave a certain way because of that role. Um, and so I oftentimes have to explain that. Um, I guess what can I say? Uh, I sometimes have to find myself having to explain myself often to people. And uh, so it can be a bit awkward because uh, it makes me feel like I'm centering myself and I don't want to do that. Um, uh, even though I do like being the center of attention, not all the time. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I think for me, that's probably the most awkward. And I also don't like being reduced into a particular category. Like, 
because people refer to me as Father Jerry, they always assume that I need to be treated um, in a masculine way. And then when I show up in a skirt or doing really flamboyant things, they don't know what to do with all of that. And then vice versa, right? Uh, so uh, it's always uh, it's always awkward and, and stuff. And uh, go ahead, go ahead. Sorry, I think too, the, the thing that Jerry talked about earlier that I just wanna highlight again is that difference between you know, we exist in the community. Like I am because we are kind of that idea of like, so we have certain roles and, and things that we will do sometimes. And so sometimes people don't understand our sense of humor or like if we, if we are being inappropriate, that's just part of our role if everybody's too serious. Um, and so sometimes people are like, what are you doing? And they don't, they don't understand that. But if they saw us in our own tribal communities, then they would understand that. And that's, I think, something that sometimes people get wrong. The other thing is just the inherent racism that exists in the community in general, like the fetishizing of, mm -hmm. of people of color that happens to all different colors, right? Like if you're this ethnicity, you're going to be a top. And if you're this one, you're going to be a bottom. And if you're this, it's like just all this ridiculousness that, that exists and we, we don't always get to just be ourselves. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Absolutely that. Um, there's a question that came up from the community. Um, what are the things that what are things that the community looks to identify a person who is two spirit? Like are there are there certain things that are that are part of how uh how the community because it it sounded like people were saying, Hey, I I see you and I know um in my own experience, uh well, it's funny, not in my personal experience, but but in several stories I've heard of folks, especially in church community, where someone came and was just like, hey, I see you. <laughs> Even before you understood your own queerness, if you will. Um, what, yeah, what does it look like uh, in your families or in your in your uh, communities for people to, to, to identify someone or maybe have a, a premonition, if you will, of someone being two-spirit? I think it's a lot of things, right? So sometimes it could be a dream that the the person that like your grandma or your auntie or I guess it has to be a woman, but like somebody would have. Sometimes this other wink day people would talk to the family and be like, hey, I think you need to make sure that you teach your kid X, Y, and Z about this because we see this. Sometimes it's the the person doing something that's the other gender role, but then you have to delineate between whether that person is transgender or two-spirit. So if they do both, you know, that would be a, a more of a versus just doing the one. So I think it can come from a lot of different places. And then for us, the ceremony looks kind of like you have multiple like masculine identified things and feminine identified things, and then different relatives will ask you to go in and bring them something. And so if, if everything you bring out is a masculine identified thing, then, and you are uh, female bodied, then that would put you in the two spirit role. If you were um, like, if, if you're male bodied and you bring in feminine things for everyone, that that puts you also in the two spirit role. That so would be like what the ceremony sort of looked like a long time ago. Well, anything to add, Jerry? Um, I'm not a familiar um, if with whether or not we had in the past a ceremony for identifying two spirit people. Um, I think this is a good place to make a, a important point between uh, native people who are reconnecting and native people who were um, mm. born on reservations or who were born in the community that they, uh, their family originates from. Um, and also I, I think it's a good place to point out that at least from like my tribe and a lot of Central and South American tribes, um, a lot of our culture was destroyed during colonization. So we don't have, like particularly the Mexica, we were really known for codifying everything. We we had a lot of codexes that showcases how to do rituals, um, understandings about our different spirituality um, and our creation story. And a lot of that was destroyed or um, or things were written about it that was then pushed, uh, false things were written about it, that was then pushed into the narrative. Um, and then myths get promulgated, like the fact, um, like the most common one for my tribe is that we 
sacrificed people <laughs> and and we ate people and none of that is true the uh the pueblo people also have uh, get accused of that as well and none of that is true white people make that up to scare people um against natives um so i'm not totally sure if we have a specific ritual i do know that just from my experience of growing up that um my family picked up on the way that I did things differently. And because I was also a very sickly child, I was born with some birth defects and health issues. Um, I always had a, a microscope on me, literally and metaphorically. And so um, I think people noticed when I played with toys that a boy didn't play with um, and uh, and then obviously I, I, I carried a purse everywhere I went, you know? And so uh, I think people noticed it and uh, did not really emphasize it, but pointed it out in such a way. Like for instance, I'll give you an example of story. When I was a child, uh, we went to my dad's family uh, for Christmas and we were having this big Christmas dinner. Um, and then afterwards we uh, opened up gifts. Well, and now really well connected to that part of the family. And so they don't really know what I wanted um, and they didn't ask what I wanted. And so I got a whole bunch of like Tonka trucks and like toy soldiers and all this stuff. And like, I don't want any of them. I, like, I would have been happy with makeup um, or, <laughs> or a book. Um, and uh, I remember uh, very distinctly after that going home, my mother asked me, do you um, like it when people give you trucks and like those kinds of toys? And I said, no, I don't, I don't find them fun or playful. And um, she's like, okay, we won't tell, we'll tell everybody not to get those for you next time. Um, and then from that point on, I don't ever recall getting anything like that. Um, and so uh, I had a lot of experiences like that, uh, that I think helped to form this identity. Cool, cool. cool. Um, I'm going to echo what Jerry yeah, said and say like that that happens, you know, in our like our tribe too. lost a bunch of ceremonies and colonization. And so there's plenty there's ceremonies that we have now that we knew we had the ceremony a long time ago, but we lost exactly how it operated. And so they've kind of recreated it and we, it probably doesn't look exactly how it did, you know, hundreds of or a thousand years ago. But we know that it was important. So wiping of the tears is an example of that when we do that after uh, after a period of mourning, but we just a year later. Um, we knew like the elements of it. And so like, well, we're going to create it and it's going to look, and we're just going to do it. And so now they do it. And then now it's a pretty standard one, but most people don't realize that that had been lost. And we just knew that there was elements of it. And the same is true of this thing that I talked about. Like, I knew the part of like, it's, you know, you take things out and you give them to people, but I don't know exactly how they did that. Did they have to sing X certain songs beforehand and X certain songs afterward? And who goes first? Is it the female or the male? Does it depend on the gender of the person that's in there? And like, there's all of these different things. And But um, they do it, some people do it, and but we don't know if that's exactly how it was back then. But so is the Eucharist, right? Nobody really knows exactly how it was. And mm -hmm. so that, you know, as we find new Dead Sea whatever, or however they, you know, then we, then we change it as we learn or we don't because we are Protestant or we're whatever, you know, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think you, you, you bring up another, um, another important thing uh, when it comes to one, I'm a huge fan of creating ritual and, and doing what we creating the rituals that we need for now. Right. Like there may have been a way that something was done once upon a time and for all kinds of reasons, like colonization, it's lost. But we are still creatives and creators, right? We're in the image and likeness of the divine. So I love, I love to hear that that new rituals being established based on, you know, we're, this is what we have, and we'll do what we can with it, right? Um, and that that leads me into this conversation about the church at large. Um, what what do you think? Um, what do you think is valuable to learn from two spirit people or what's the, what might be, I know you've mentioned a little bit about the keeping balance. What's the gift of two spirit people for the church at large, whether indigenous or not, you know, big, small question. <laughs> I will uh, say that you kind of answered it already in the sense of about the, the concept of ritual um, and ceremony. Uh, I oftentimes in the congregation I work in currently, um, 
I often remind them that even having coffee hour after the Eucharist is ceremony. Um, like ceremony doesn't happen because we have vestments on and we use archaic languages and um, and uh, you know we light candles and all this stuff. Uh, ceremony, ritual, liturgy, whatever you want to call it, happens because we are existing. Um, our very essence is inherently sacred. Um, and learning to to see uh, faith in that way helps us to um, broaden our understanding of what it means to be church. And suddenly um, our life becomes uh, the story that we are telling, you know, um, not just a particular chapter of the story, but our entire life is the story. Um, and so I think helping to remind the church at large and in our local communities uh, to move beyond this binary thinking is important. Um, and also, uh, and this is hard for liturgical churches, um, but also like coming to terms with the reality that spirit might be pushing us into an age where we need to reimagine what it means to be a sacramental people. Um, we might need new sacraments uh, for the times that we are in. Um, we might need to reimagine- And what are sacraments for the, for the evangelicals? <laughs> uh, uh, an outward sign instituted by Christ that meant to give grace of an inward reality. If you want a technical definition, that um, was deep. Give me, give me the 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 the, the kindergarten version. <laughs> um, physical acts that we do um, to give a direction or a point to something holy happening. Um, is that is that good? Definitely. Yeah. What What are some examples of sacraments? Um, Shaniko, you can answer that. Eucharist and baptism are the two that are like that were instituted by Christ that are not. Those are pretty. Most churches would all agree with those two. And then we get fuzzy about all the others: ordination and weddings and um, confession and unction and uh, yeah. But as any kind of outward and visible sign of an inward and spiritual grace. And an example, like in baptism, right? The outward and visible sign is you're washing with water. Um, and the inward is that you become part of the family of Christ, right? Or part of the body of Christ. I, um, a great example, I think, of this would be um, some years ago, uh, I forget who it was. I think it was the United Church of Christ, or maybe the United Church of Canada, um, began to uh, have in their congregations uh, name chain ceremonies that were designed to link us to our understanding of baptism. And it was a way of incorporating our trans siblings as valued members in the body of Christ. Um, Native people have similar things, you know, we have uh, naming ceremonies and things like that. Um, I think that's a great example of where Native people can help provide some wisdom on uh, rites of passage, which I think is something that we really need desperately in the Christian church. Um, but also the human family at large. And um, yeah, I had another thought, but it went out the window again. <laughs> I was kind of struggling too, when you asked that question, Darren, between like, which of the things could they learn from us as two spirits versus which of the things could they learn from us just as indigenous people? Because I think those are so overlapping that I was struggling to try and- like, I want it all. <laughs> sort of push them out. The things that I thought of one was like, Seeing difference as sacred, like that, rather as opposed to something other and bad. Um, and then that like idea that, which I think our church is kind of bad at, that, that, that we need to be able to walk between things sometimes, right? If everybody is doing, like, let's say, you know, we have lots of churches that don't have clergy and it's like, well, maybe you don't need to have a fancy degree to be able to go up there and do what you need to do, right? You don't have to have an MDiv to be able to preach, but we need preachers. So, Somebody needs to get called and go up there and do it, even if they don't have the fancy degree. And I think if it if we didn't have this idea that like church has to be perfect, which is another thing they could learn from indigenous people, but like if we just had this idea that we are we are the church, we're going to be the church, then we all have to take responsibility and go do that, right? Liturgy means the work of the people. And so it's like, what is my role in it? And if you look and see how we do ceremony, uh, like I'll use a local example of a funeral, everybody has a role there that they're going to do. Everyone. And so 
you know, my favorite role was to go in the kitchen and help get bossed around by some auntie or grandma and just start cooking. I'd be like, make this macaroni salad and, you know, cut this meat and, you know, whatever. And that, that, somebody else tell me what to do. Love it. I don't have to think and I can grieve and, you know, whatever. And then, you know, but we have things that everybody will do something. And so it's like, I wish people could see church that way, that we all have something we're supposed to be doing besides sitting on our butts and putting money in the little basket that comes around or whatever it is. But, you know, there's more than just, let me get off the stairbox. I think you get my point. I love it. I absolutely love it. I, my, my personal motto is we all have a role in making the world a better place for everyone in it. And so, yeah, I am, I am on board because I, 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 I like that illustration of the body of Christ as we all have different functions and different parts, but we make the whole whole, right? Um, we have just a few minutes left. If, if you could talk about both of you, if you could talk about, um, your uh, experiences of joy as a two spirit person or as indigenous, like what, what are some of the moments that, that really just, you're like, yes, this is, this is life. Um, what's it I think that for me, it, I find a lot of joy in in music. Um, I that's one of the ways that I get to keep some of my uh, ceremony ceremonial traditions alive. Um, in my current life, um, I have found lots of answers to prayers in music. Um, I have uh, I have dreams sometimes in music, and. Um, so it's a very safe and sacred space for me. And it's often the place that I go to when I need to cultivate that joy um, and find strength. And uh, so, yeah, I think that's my answer. I, I guess I hadn't thought about it this way, but I think I find joy in like being able to be fully integrated in my community. like hearing other people's stories about where they have to like their clergy and they have to be in the closet or they can't be fully out or fully themselves or whatever. And I feel like I get to just be fully myself. I don't have to be something I'm not or pretend to be something I'm not. And I, I never thought of that as bringing me joy, but I, I think that is. The other thing would be like, uh, anytime I get to see like generational things happening. So like um, when I see, you know, there's grandmas and, you know, they might not be with us next year. And then there's parents and there's little kids running around and they're all together. And I think so often I look in a lot of our churches, especially in the Episcopal church, and it's like all this white and gray hair. And and not that I don't respect my elders because I do, but it's like, there's no children there, you know? And then when children do come, they're like, they're being so noisy. La, 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 la. And it's like, if you come to like, when I do that, the Indian church, there's like kids running around and you know, all this stuff. And, you know, it's, it's wonderful because then you see this and if you involve them, it's like this Easter and uh, two Easter's ago too, like we blessed the holy water and I had the kids put their hands in the water as we were blessing it. And they wanted to be the ones to throw the holy water on the people as we were doing the little sprinkly, right? And I was like, well, remember, we're not just throwing it meanly at them. This is we're reminding them of their baptism. And I have this beautiful image of the youngest kid who's like three, doesn't even talk yet. Well, now he can talk, but that year he couldn't talk and he's like dabbing the holy water on this grandma and she died the next year and not because he dabbed on her but you know what I mean like she wasn't <laughs> around like she was you know and it was just so beautiful and it's like moments like that that just bring me so much make me cry is beautiful and so I think things like that and being able to walk with communities on this journey and they're as a two-skirt you get invited to these moments that some other folks don't and it's the same thing with clergy right you get invited to these moments that like people taking their last breath or a child being born or, you know, these very, very sacred moments and you get to be a part of that. And I think that's where I find joy. I absolutely love it. And um, we're, we're just about at, at our time for today. Um, the, the chat is lit with wonderful questions. And um, I wanted to, to take a few moments just to, to, if you're okay with that, to, to, share some of the, some of the questions and we'll kind of do I guess rapid fire for this um I had a question from Phil let me find it real quick um was it about okay. puberty rights 
Uh, yeah, well, it was, it was about age and ad adolescence and, and, you know, uh, so yes, please to restate the question in, in human form, since I can't, since I'm tongue tied. <laughs> it was something like, is the two spirit identification thing similar to age, uh, coming of age and they're, they're different. They could be done much earlier. Um, and, um, the puberty rights are separate. So that, that answered that. And could you um, tell us a little bit about those, what, what the puberty rights are, what that means or it looks like? Unfortunately, well, I can, but like we really only have one for women. Men's coming of age happens based on how, what they do, um, how they, like if they go and kill their first buffalo or things like that, we would be determined to be, we, we separate autonomy very differently. They're usually autonomous from, from a very young age. Um, and so as women, though, when they get their first menses, they have a whole special ceremony. I remember being very upset that I never got one. Because um, all, my, all my girl cousins, they all got one. Um, it's called throwing the ball is the name of it. And there's like a ceremony and um, we, um, we have a giveaway. I, I don't want to get into all the details, but yes, it's its own special thing. If if it were appropriate, I would I would throw you a, a celebration myself because it sounds awesome. <laughs> Oh, I also wanted to to clarify. Uh, we we talked about this before before this gathering started. Um, but are there preferences around the the terms Indian, Indigenous, Native, um, and could you you know share any insights that would be helpful for others on those terms? Do you want to answer that? You want me to? I can. Indian is a legal word. It means a member of a federally recognized tribe. So all Indians are Native, all Indians are Indigenous, all Indians are Native Americans. But not all Native Americans, not all Indigenous people are enrolled members, and therefore they're not all Indians. And it's also one of those words where if you're if you're Indian, you can use that word. White people are kind of uncomfortable using it, but it is a legal word. It is used. And so when you say Indian country, that means like all of Indigenous America. Usually Indian country refers to like... Um, Canada and the United States, it doesn't usually include Hawaii, um, and it doesn't always usually include Central and South America, but I have heard it include that before. So it kind of depends on who's talking about it. I like it because it kind of means all of like the reservations and the urban Indians and all, you know, all the things. Mm -hmm. I would also say, like, don't feel, if you are a non-Native person, like, don't feel bad using the word Indian if it's in a title of something. Um, like, I don't know, the American Indian Museum in DC, for instance, like if you, you don't need to change it to American Indigenous Museum just because you, you don't want to use that word. Like if it's in the title of something, use it, but don't use it as a reference to Native people um, casually because it is considered to be in, uh, inappropriate. And, and mate, I, you know, I'm, I'm just kind of uh, going, going off script a little bit. Um, I've heard some conversation about remembering that I never pronounced the word right. And and did and did and j and day Jeanette? And Being indigenous. Thank you. <laughs> it is a long day. Um, but I remember uh some conversation about how uh that that's a concept that is here and other other places you can be indigenous to africa you can be indigenous to different places um and it's important to acknowledge that there are some um there are ways to that we appropriate and then there are ways that different indigenous groups from different continents have similar practices um the spirit animal one is a is a is a version that i've heard come up because a lot of people use it as a just borrowing from a culture that they're not a part of, but there are spirit animal practices uh, that are indigenous to Africa. But again, we have to, I think we have to have context for when we're using these words and why, and not just make it like a pop culture kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, I, I hear, I see your heads nodding. Are you on the same page or what do you, what do you think about that? Absolutely. I think context is important. Um... I think uh, specificity is revolutionary. Um, so uh, being intentional with your words is important and um, and doing showing respect as best as you can.
And if you don't know, ask. You know, I, I don't think seeking clarity is ever a bad thing. Leading with curiosity, which is one of the principles that you mentioned in the beginning, um, I think it's always a, a good practice going forward. Um, yeah. And when I've seen gathering of Indigenous folks from across the world, they all come into the community and it's kind of like whoever's leading it, usually it's whoever's land we're on, we're going to do what they do. So maybe we go clockwise, but in their culture, they go counterclockwise. And we're okay with that. We understand that that's the way it is. And we know that they're going to do, they're going to pray in their way. And it might not be how we pray, but we understand that they're doing it in a good way and that's okay. And so we, we of course, are going to, like, it's really neat to see them all come together and how they how they do stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's not always the same, but there's certain elements that are almost always the same. Yeah. I would also too want to point out because Shaniqua mentioned it and I did not mention it because I was thinking about other things, but uh, we also have two words for two spirit in the Nahuatl language, uh, Shoshiwa, which is the word that I use, um, which means flower bearer in Patach, uh, Patach, uh, what's how do I do that? Patach, Patach, Patach. That's a hard word to say, <laughs> uh, which is the word that we would use for female bodied uh, two spirit people. Gotcha. Okay. We have had a really, really, I'm like, I need another hour because <laughs> y'all are awesome. And I love, I love this learning opportunity. Um, as we close, are there any last thoughts that you'd like to share with the community that's gathered now or who will watch this in replay? Thank you for being here and thank you for listening and Yeah, and I hope that uh, this has been enlightening for people. I hope it brought healing to your mind, body, spirit, and um, and that you go from this place uh, with a little bit more curiosity, a little bit more information, and feeling more empowered to show up as your authentic self. Awesome, awesome. And if people would like to follow up with you in any kind of public-facing way, if there's not a public-facing one, don't worry about it. But is there any place that you'd uh, recommend fo folks to to follow up with you or any um, resources and materials that you love to recommend to folks? And I know that's an on-the-spot question, so not too much pressure. You can find my number on the bathroom wall. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just joking. Not really. Um, I'm all over the internet, all over social media. It's very easy. Just look up the People's Priest. You'll find all things me there. Um, and uh, yeah, if you see me at the bathhouse, say hi. I put my email in the chat. If you okay. need to get in touch with me, you can. Awesome. So appreciate it. Uh, Carrie, can you um, take us on home?